Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I also want to thank those who are joining us live on our webcast. Uh, we are talking about the New York City Center for Economic Opportunity. Uh, this event is sponsored by, co-sponsored by Results for America, Washington Monthly, and AEI. I hope you all have read the four-part series in Washington Monthly, which we are really excited about um, getting out there, and we believe it will continue to live on and inform many other aspects of policy going forward. Center for Economic Opportunity is one of the most interesting and innovative things, experiments in government. New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg brought a culture of using data and evidence to the city government, and his leadership made evidence and CEO the backbone of New York City's anti-poverty strategy. New York City is, of course, unique in many ways, given the size and level of resources. But today we want to talk about how the lessons that were learned in New York City with the Center for Economic Opportunity could be applied to other cities, to the federal government, and also how this could potentially be a foundation for a bipartisan approach for fighting poverty. We're also going to talk a little bit about the Social Innovation Fund, which played an enormous role in the scale of CEO and helped scale five anti-poverty programs elsewhere in the country. As many of you know, the Social Innovation Fund was created by a bipartisan majority in Congress and signed by the President in 2009. Melody led that effort um, in the White House. Across the country, the Social Innovation Fund grantees are finding and scaling community solutions with evidence of results in over 40 states, and they've mobilized over $800 million to go toward programs that are building evidence and using evidence to address community problems. Despite the reach and the purpose of you know, funding what works and using evidence-based approaches, um, we continue to fight each year in Congress to make sure that the Social Innovation Fund is is funded, so we want to make an extra point of talking about how CEO was benef benefited and the scale of CEO benefited from the Social Innovation Fund, just to underscore once again in Washington, D.C., two members of Congress, what an important effort that is. So finally, um, I just want to introduce our panelists today. We're proud to have Melody Barnes, uh, Robert Dorn, and Linda Gibbs, who are all Results for America Senior Fellows. Uh, our senior fellow program was started by Karen Anderson, who's sitting in the front row, um, in 2015 to attract high caliber scholarship and strategic thinking to challenges facing young people, their families, and communities around the world, and better understanding how to apply what works. Melody is the co-founder of MB2 Solutions and the former White House domestic policy advisor under President Obama. Robert Doerr is a senior fellow at AEI and former commissioner of New York City's Human Resources Administration. Linda Gibbs is a principal at Bloomberg Associates and the former deputy mayor of New York City. I also want to thank Gordon Berlin, who's the president of MDRC and who has been a key advisor for Results for America since our founding four years ago. And we have, um, I'm happy to say, Matt Klein, who's also sitting in the front row, the current head of um, CEO. And, um, glad he's here to add any additions of sort of how it's how it's developed after the transition in, in administrations. So now I'm going to turn it over to our panel moderator, Paul Glastris, editor in chief of the Washington Monthly, to kick off the discussion. And just a special thank you for um, publishing this series. It really was a great. It was great, our pleasure. Great thank process. you. Uh, thank you, Michelle. So they published. We published <laughs> the draft in, in a four-part series in the Washington Monthly. And here's one thing they said: quote. Today, low-wage workers are getting extra cash in their pockets at tax time to help support their kids. New programs are helping more workers earn their associate's degrees to boost their wages. Better access to financial education and financial services is helping families manage their budgets and even to save. But don't take their word for it. In 2012, Harvard's Kennedy School of Government bestowed its prestigious innovation in American Government Award on the Center for Economic Opportunity, saying the following. Over the last five years, CEO has collaborated with 28 city agencies to launch and scale up more than 50 programs and 50 policy initiatives in the areas of asset development, employment and training, and education. 
Not only is the Center for Economic Opportunity innovative, it demonstrates a sea change in how a city can unite the disparate interests of previously siloed agencies, funders, and providers, and businesses to tackle poverty, uh, one of our nation's major growing challenges. Folks, this is a very big deal. And it's especially relevant now in the middle of a presidential season uh, in which the, there's unmistakable signs from the public that they are frustrated with income inequality and the stagnation of upward mobility. So I think this is a, a terrific uh, chance to learn something new and, and get it into the conversation here in Washington. And I'm, I'm delighted to be on the panel with these folks. So let me start my questioning with Linda. Um, Apparently, from, from the story that you published uh, in the Washington Monthly, Mayor Bloomberg gets reelected in 2005 and decides to declare war on poverty. Now, <laughs> this is an audacious promise, considering the last guy that did that LBJ didn't work out too well for him. What was on his mind? What was it like inside the administration when he decided to do this? Mm -hmm. Well, it was actually the creation of, the, um, of my position that led us to have a conversation around what would a deputy mayor for health and human services actually do. In his first administration, he had a single deputy for operations, and all of the commissioners reported um, through the deputy for operations. And he decided to, um, to break it down a little bit in the second term. And he was interviewing all the commissioners and asking their opinion. And... Um, <coughs> In addition to asking him for the job, um, I also said, I think what a deputy mayor for health and human services should do is help to bring together the multiple agencies that work within their silos on their particular sort of crisis intervention, whether it's child welfare or homeless services or income support. And they, you should find a, um, a way and a mechanism to bring, it together, to bring all of them together so that they can really explore the fundamental issue that they are all grappling with, which is the, the, the cause of poverty and the consequences of concentrated populations living in poverty and how we can make a difference around that. And it, so it, it led to this conversation where essentially that he said that is in fact what he wanted me to do, which I was very happy about that me part. And, um, and so what we, um, but it was also <coughs> super interesting because he had, um, he had two major, um, he said, do, he's like, go out there, discover it, talk to whoever you need to, figure out um, what the most exciting opportunities are and possibilities, but two things that, the only two requests I have. I want you to help to identify what's gonna lift people out of poverty. He says, New York, we're so generous, we have this, you know, a, a huge safety net. Of course the safety net can always be stronger, I'm more interested in what is going to have people no longer need the safety net. So I want an agenda of economic opportunity. And, um, and the other thing he said, and I want you to be honest about what happens and whether or not these interventions work. And if they don't work, I want you to be brave enough to cut the funding and move dollars to the places that do work. And um, if they do work, um, then we'll know that's where investments have to happen. And the really important thing that I would say is that the CEO was a, um, the annual budget we, was $100 million of new resources to do um, really radical experimentation in New York. It, um, it's emblematic of the approach that he takes across the board. Um, and so it was happening, of course, simultaneously with our education efforts. It was happening simultaneously with our employment and economic development efforts. And, um, and I see the CEO's role in the, res the end result of the, um, the, the decline in poverty in New York as um, being a contributing factor and alongside those other efforts and really amplifying and deepening those. The last thing I would say in response to, you know, what was the environment like? It was scary. I was like, I, I was really, um, it was, I was trying to, I wanted to manage a process where we had as much imp input as possible um, from, you know, our greatest allies and our greatest detractors, sort of a big tent approach, let's listen to it all. And there was a lot of resistance. People really wanted to push back on, you know, the safety net versus the opportunity approach. And, 
Um, and there were a lot of providers at the table who all had the best solution you ever heard of, right? And so they, you know, they, wa they wanted the resources. And so what was super, super critical for us in the process was the data from start to middle to end. And so the whole inquiry started with as robust of an exploration of the existing baseline data and prioritizing the significant populations within the whole, and then using data along the way to inform whether the interventions were in fact having the results that we wanted, and then using the data um, in deep evaluations to see whether the, the short-term wins in fact had long-lasting impact. So that's the, that was the CEO job to do the hard work associated with gathering, analyzing, and disseminating that data. Thank you. Gotcha. Now, picking up on that, Robert, um, CEO didn't try to cover the waterfront. There was a process you all went through, my understanding is, to say, all right, you know, there's two million or a million five people living in poverty in New York. We're going to focus on half of those, 700,000, I think that's the number. How did you do that? How did, how did you target <clears throat> those groups? What was the process? Why? Well, first of all, I didn't do it. Uh, Linda did it. Okay. <laughs> and that's a major message that I have to convey here, that Mayor Bloomberg, picking up a little bit on what Linda said, Mayor Bloomberg decided I'm going to take on this audacious challenge, partly motivated because Linda told him he should, and then he picked the right person to make it happen, and he centered the authority and power very close to him in City Hall so that any agency head, like myself, in the big bureaucracy of New York City knew this was a priority and we had to pay attention. Right. And that is enormously important in making something happen. When a, when a leader makes it their priority, puts power behind it and authority, and gives a strong person the, the, the tools to do it, uh, it can happen. And I, I can't stress that enough. So and Linda got her, and got her calls returned. Linda got her, uh, got her calls returned. The, yeah, people ran right over to see her. Yeah. I mean, it, we didn't play around because it was clear it was important to the mayor and, it, and Linda was determined to make it happen. Um, so, uh, and then in the evaluation of what was going on with regard to poverty among subpopulations in the city, they convened a group of outsiders and providers and leaders and, and experts and identified three groups. Uh, the, the working poor, uh, young adults between 18 and 25 who were struggling and out of, out of work, not really engaged in the labor force in the way we would want them to be, and children under five. And that is a subset, and they said, this is where we're going to focus. So instead of having kind of a scatter shot, go at it anyway, let's look at where we're weakest in our current safety net uh, welfare policies that were in existence in New York City. And that guided, that sort of determination that these were where we're going to focus, guided the decisions on what kind of innovations to put in place. And then it also guided the metrics in determining whether you had good outcomes. I mean, are we making, are we moving the needle on, on young children? Are we moving the needle on young adults? And, and are we, what are we doing about the working poor? So um, they were inclusive. They involved a lot of uh, participants. They made decisions. And then they had an action-driven agenda. And okay. uh, the mayor stuck with it. And, so did Linda. So, so Linda, you, Michelle said you had a hundred million dollar budget. Not every city gets a hundred million dollars <coughs> to to play around with. Where, where, where did that money come from? Mm -hmm. And and you know, what what was the source of that money? It was a public-private partnership, and so about half of it was in the early years. Half of it were um, was a new investment of tax dollars that the mayor committed to. And the other half were from philanthropic partners um, that were invested in this strategy and invested in New York and very eager to um, participate in these experiments. And I think that was really an interesting lesson for me. Making the case to the philanthropies around the investments was made stronger by the fact that the city was putting up its own dollars, but that we had this really rigorous evaluation um, structure and that their investment was going to be contributing to, to um, it, was, it was going in in a way that was going to be very accountable for the outcomes, but we, we hoped, and as it in fact has turned out to be, we hoped it was actually going to contribute to the national dialogue on poverty alleviation and um, be a um, sort of an incubator of new ideas that could be looked at for lessons for future national policy as well. And I think that got the, the foundations excited. I work in um, a lot of cities now across the U.S., and 
Um, nobody has the budget anywhere near, near New York City. In some cases, the entire social services budget is $50 million, right? And so, the, and this I think will, we, sh we should explore this more in later conversation, but um, a lot of time I spend in those cities is thinking about the, the structure and process of the CEO as applied to existing resources helping to understand whether the baseline of dollars that are already being spent are in fact working and how you could pull both those really innovative le lessons of um, sort of local modifications that are producing results and share those, but also helping localities figure out where they're wasting those really, really, really precious tax dollars. Let, let's get concrete for a minute for the audience and talk about the actual programs themselves. And, and, and and let me, let me ask you, Robert, a, a kind of uh, a somewhat difficult question. Before we go on to the programs that you all are most proud of that worked the best, there were some programs that you all funded that didn't work out so well. C tell me about one of those. Well, um, the, the one that got the most attention and was sort of the most notorious in, the, in the certain, certain quarters of city uh, politics was the conditional cash transfer program which um, uh, conditional, cash. conditional cash transfer, which, what's that? which the CEO had brought back from a program that was uh, in Mexico that rewarded people for taking actions that were good for them and their family. For instance, doing, having their children attend and do better in school, having their children uh, go to uh, med medical checkups, retaining Medicaid coverage, uh, getting a job. There were aspects of uh, kind of, and it didn't seem to me too different from some of the premises of welfare reform, which is that if you, if you go to work, we want to help you, and we want to, we want to reward and, and, and enhance uh, uh, attachment to the labor force. So, but the conditional cash transfer was a, a check writing exercise. There was an aspect of that. And um, I think as it was implemented and very rigorously evaluated, and really uh, Gordon can tell you more about it than the details of evaluation, it didn't change the, or didn't seem to lead to the significant changes in behavior that we had hoped for. Uh, the differences between, uh, between the control group and the experimental group or the treatment group were very small. And this was something that uh, was disappointing to those who would hope that it would have greater progress. Um, but the mayor took, a, and this is where the, the match of the C, former CEO mayor and the CEO that he put in place with Linda really fit. He had a very strong feeling that if, um, that Programs, uh, programs in America that try to help poor Americans uh, that don't work continue to get funded without anybody really paying attention to them. They get sort of baked in and you can never cut them or end them. The mayor felt very strongly that if the evaluation came back unsuccessful, we were going to have the guts to say, we're going to stop or we're going to change or we're going to alter or we're going to limit. And um, that's what we did. Gordon, you had a unique role in, in, in all this. You, you run one of the premier evaluative organizations. Um, you were also something of an advisor. Tell us about that role. Sure. So <clears throat> almost from the beginning, as Linda indicated, um, a CEO was putting its agenda together when it formed the Poverty Commission that would really lay out that agenda. They had a very big tent, and they were reaching out to experts both with program experience evaluation experience and policy experience. And we were, MDRC was one of those sources of um, information. As the process evolved and they began to hone in on the problems that they wanted to address um, and began to think about the kinds of solutions that might work, we helped gather evidence along with others um, that would help them choose what they would uh, go after. And then we played an evaluator role, and sometimes what we call a demonstration role. So some of the programs that they had in mind were really expansions of existing programs like Save USA, which was a matched savings program that had been run in the city for some time with some success, and now they wanted to take it farther and get a more rigorous study done, and we did that particular study. Other projects, like the conditional cash transfer, required learning what they did in Mexico, adapting it to a developed country, adapting it to a, a city in which there was already a safety net. Um, so there were a lot of program design and research design challenges that had to be faced. And we were the firm that they um, came to to help them 
uh, work through those program design and um, evaluation design challenges, and then to actually oversee the implementation of the program by the local providers that they selected, uh, and then to conduct the, the evaluation over time. So, so Robert's given us an example of a program that didn't work. Give us a, an example. You've looked at a lot of these, all, I guess all of them. Um, what is a, maybe the program that you're most, that really, you know, did the best and the, that is exciting to think about? Well, there are several of them, I'm glad to report. Um, <laughs> but if I had to pick one, um, because I, I think I would pick um, the City University of New York's Accelerated Studies and Associates program, everything about this program is wonderful except the title. Um, so let's just call it CUNY ASAP. Um, here was um, a pro the problem that um, the City University of New York and CEO wanted to address. The graduation rates in the nation's community colleges and at CUNY are woefully low. Um, and a remarkable fraction of the students who go to college in America start in a community college. So this was really an important issue and it was especially the place where people um, of color who were low income and a lot of city residents started. Um, so what CUNY did was look back at what had been done previously um, and there were things that involved financial incentives and there were initiatives that involved student supports, all of which had produced small effects that generally went away over time. And after a lot of internal discussion, they decided to pull those packages together. Um, and they did it in a really interesting responsibility and opportunity kind of framework, which was unusual in the, in the college higher ed realm. So on the responsibility side, the requirement to be part of ASAP was you had to go full time. Secondly, you needed to take any remedial developmental ed courses first. All the students that were targeted in the study that we did um, were students who needed to take these developmental ed courses before they could qualify for credit bearing courses. So we wanted those, the, they wanted those gotten out of the way. And third, if the advisement process and the way they were doing in school warranted it, they needed to go for tutoring. In return, the City University of New York promised them essentially free tuition. It waived the tuition above and beyond whatever Pell or other support they had um, was contributing. Secondly, they gave them free use of textbooks. Third, they added a Metro card so that students could travel freely to and from school. And they provided tutoring and an advisor who had a small caseload who could work with them. Um, what happened as a result of this initiative? Three years later, um, the control group, we used a randomized control trial, so we had a group of young people who didn't get in randomly, and a, and a group who got in randomly uh, to ASAP. The graduation rate at the end of three years was 22% for the control group. The graduation rate for those who were participating in ASAP was 40%. Now that's the kind of quantum leap that no one has seen in most social programs, and especially uh, in the community college area. So what's happened since? Um, to their credit, CEO, and now, importantly, a new mayor, put an initially $50 million into expanding the CUNY ASAP program uh, throughout the colleges in the city of New York, and they've doubled down again um, since that time. So a major expansion right away. And the big issue in all of this work is we do things on a small scale, we find out they work, but we don't really take them to scale. That's the new frontier for a lot of these programs. Next, um, based on that experience, we began working with some colleges in Ohio. There are three community colleges in Ohio now who are running a similar program, adapted for and redesigned for um, that location. And I'm really pleased to report, we'll be releasing a report in a few months that shows at the end of two semesters, credit accumulation, um, persistence, that is re-enrollment from one semester to the next, is tracking pretty closely the kind of results we saw on ASAP. And I, I think that's really dramatic. That's very uh, unusual. Last point. Um, sorry, I'm so excited about this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm dancing it, over here. <laughs> it was expensive. But interestingly, that is $4,600 a year. That's a lot of money on top of the regular cost. Um, the, um, interestingly, though, the cost per graduate was actually lower. Why? Because so many more students were graduating. Well, in the replication effort now underway in the city of New York, they've gotten that cost down to just under $4,000. 
In the Ohio example, we've gotten it down to under 3,000, although it's a somewhat different program. And I hope we'll continue to make progress there, figuring out where that threshold is um, at which you can operate the program at a lower cost but still get these kind of quantum leap results. Um, yeah, no, awesome. yeah, awesome. This is happening in other contexts. I just happen to know this because we're doing a lot of higher ed stuff. When you get an extra year in a college, that's extra tuition. Yeah. And so there's, there's the ability there to either break even or actually for a college to make a buck. Um, Melody, um, having seen a lot of poverty prevention programs, <laughs> your various White House and elsewhere. Uh, what, in your estimation, made CPT go up? What Award was it winning. that they did <laughs> that others haven't done? Sure. And we've touched on some of those themes already in our conversation, but a, a quick list as I was thinking about this. One, that this was an empowered organization with a very clear strategy. You know, it sat in the mayor's office. It had empowered leadership. And at the same time that it was centralized in that way, it also had a mandate to reach out and across. So out and across government, but also into the communities that make up New York City. The ideas that came into CEO were coming from a whole range of stakeholders. And CEO was also playing the role of evaluating, determining which programs should go forward, providing technical assistance, et cetera. Um, secondly, I think CEO also walked the talk on innovation, and that's hard to do, and it did it in several ways. I mean, one, with the innovation lab, executing those responsibilities that I just mentioned, and taking programs from those that were untested to those that had some proof behind them and moving, putting those into the bloodstream, but also utilizing resources in a smart way, as Linda was describing. So there were some local resources, government resources put in, but also accessing phil philanthropic resources um, so that you could take ideas, and even those that, that didn't work as they were originally presented, and lessons were learned from those ideas, but you could take some of those ideas that, you know, you may not have wanted to waltz into, you know, other parts of the government or talk to council members and others and say, hey, guess what we're going to do? We're going to give cash to, uh, you know, to families, because those are politically challenging ideas. It was, and as a result, it was able to take some of those ideas and say, we're going to experiment. We think there may be something here. Um, and that gave uh, an additional evidence base um, to the work. So I think those things were important. Looking for ways to professionalize, um, raise the bar on the way that the public sector engages with the private sector, with the philanthropic sector. Um, so putting in place that particular um, element in CEO that was there to say, this is the way that we're going to engage with the philanthropic sector in the best possible way so that we can glean the most that we can from it. Certainly, the fidelity to data and evidence. And you know, probably most people in this room and watching and people who you know, are policy data gurus and geeks are like, yes, we love data and evidence. But it's one thing to collect data, and that's challenging enough. Um, it's another thing to act on it when data, when you learn from data, something that challenges the presumption that you had going in. The thing that you thought was going to work, and you find out it actually didn't work. And as the mayor said to Linda, I want you to be brave enough to move funds, um, to cut off funds, to make adjustments when you find something's not working. Um, and I think that also racks up to the fact that there is a political gutsiness um, in all of this, um, to be willing to do that because programs have constituencies, sometimes long-standing constituencies, people who are working very, very hard, um, who believe with just a little bit more we can make this work, but at a certain point, once there's a certain amount of data and evidence and trying, you have to say this isn't the best way forward and that takes a lot of guts, and you take a lot of flack um, when you do that. It's probably more than flack, that's the nice word, um, that for what, what happens when you make some of those decisions. So I think all of those things put together um, help to make CEO and what happened in New York 
different and to achieve the kinds of results that they achieved. Gordon, do you want to add to that? I mean, again, you've seen a lot of cities, a lot of states, a lot of agencies. Well, what I, was think, different? I think in addition to what's being said here, I, I, wanted, I would emphasize this decision to focus on poverty, right? Mayors are almost always preoccupied with infrastructure issues, trash pickup, roads, bridges, zoning, mm -hmm. economic development, policing and safety. Of course, poverty is central to the, the whole nature of the quality of life in that city. And yet, because a lot of the resources and, the, and um, authorities rest more with the federal government than the state government, mayors seldom tackle that issue. And I thought it was very uh, dramatic that Linda and the mayor decided um, that poverty should be a focus. And secondly, something that um, Robert said, this was really not a standalone agency over here. Oh, those are the poverty people under Linda. It was a cross-agency catalyst in which they sought ideas from the agencies themselves, worked with the agencies to test those ideas, and then focused on institutionalization. And then stepping back, one of the things that eventually happened at CEO that I think was very powerful was the decision to build on a social innovation fund grant. Um, the social innovation fund was an Obama administration initiative. It basically said, we want to innovate. Um, Michelle actually played a, a very big conceptual role in the early thinking about that. Um, New York City was the only, uh, only place that came forward that said, we want to do this as a city. It was typically uh, a set of nonprofits that tried to do it. So what did this social innovation fund uh, bring to the table? Well, first, it brought the federal government to the table. That mattered hugely because the mayor and Linda had decided that CEO would be a laboratory for innovation, not just for New York City, but some of these things they were testing, like the conditional cash transfer, later on um, the um, singles earned income tax credit, they would require, if they were really going to happen, um, they would require federal action. Secondly, the SIF created the ability to make this a cross-city partner learning partnership. And that meant that these things, many of these ideas were being tested in multiple cities at once, and multiple cities would be much more likely to be heard and recognized if the results were positive uh, at the federal level. It would be a much more um, powerful platform for them to undertake. And last, it helped a little bit. Um, not that Lyndon the mayor didn't have cachet, but this was a, a presidential initiative. And it did help, I think, bring a lot of private funders to the table. So together with all of the innovative pieces that you've already heard about, I think the Social Innovation Fund really helped to secure its future or its role and its position in the national debate about federal po poverty policy. Can I add a point about of that? Of course. Just, uh, I can't resist. The other great thing about it was that the uh, division of responsibility between the federal government and the locality was right, in that the, the innovation, the creativity, the implementation, the decisions about how and what to do resided at the local level. And the feds were holding us to standards and evaluating and objectives and providing some funding. And that, that works. I mean, I think we, that kind of a, allowing that kind of flexibility and innovation at the local level is worth continuing. And one more thing I also <coughs> wanted to add. As I talked to uh, Linda, Robert, and Reed about what happened, there was also a willingness and a desire to go out and to share the data and evidence narrative. And I think a lot of people, particularly those in politics and policymakers, think the last thing they're going to go out is, and do is talk about data and evidence. It's like, you know, people will glaze over on that one. But recognizing the importance and being able to answer the critical who cares question and tying those two pieces together, say this is data and evidence in furtherance of this big, complex, challenging issue, and this is going to help us take on this challenge and move the city and move residents of the city forward. It's really important, and I think that's also important to the work and the success of CEO. Well, l let me pick up on something that I think Gordon said and ask Linda. New York is, is unique, is my understanding, <laughs> uh, in the scope of its responsibilities on human services, right? When I was in Chicago, I was a reporter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Chicago, f the mayor, Richard J. Daley, famously shed just about all the human services stuff to Cook County. 
because he didn't want to be in, in charge of that stuff, or to the state. New York is different. So I, I, do I have that right? Um, I hope not, um, in that um, I think that the role of mayors, and this is a bigger topic, um, but I do believe that the role of mayors is, um, is going through an evolution where um, mayors are taking new approaches to their jobs. They're not just executing what the narrow job description says. They're really thinking about the broad social challenges and, and, and broad infrastructure challenges and climate change challenges and you know, just societal challenges as a whole and thinking creatively about how to use their power and authority in um, non-traditional ways to make big change happen. And while New York City is unique in that it is a super powerful constitutional you know, executive structure, much of what we did was by bringing people who did not report to the mayor to the table. And so mayors are increasingly using the power of their position to bring collaborative partners, whether that's the state and the federal, whether that's public and private, whether that's nonprofit, you know, bringing those collaborative partners together in new approaches to managing challenges. So it's not just about having a listening session and talking and getting input and then going back to City Hall and doing the job. It's really changing the way they manage to include those partners in ongoing structures of, of co-management. And um, the, so I do think that um, the model that the, that the CEO reflects, I mean, it was, it was so interesting to me. We would have a meeting of the 28 agencies that were involved in the, in the work, and you know, most of my agencies were not there. The solutions were <laughs> under the economic development deputy mayor, under the, um, a, a philanthropic partner, under the education system. It was a group of people who came together in their shared commitment to tackle poverty in new ways, and what brought them together was that shared value and the data. And this model of you know, this, these new approaches, they're super hard, because it takes a lot more time to agree with a lot of people than to agree with yourself, right? And so it's just like a lot of time, it's a lot of people are sick of seeing each other, and like not another meeting, but you just gotta stick with it, and you've gotta find ways you know, of, of, of sharing power and authority and ceding control and sometimes going along with decisions you don't like because that's what it takes in order to move a full agenda forward. And it also made it that clear to the other agencies that the poverty issue was not only the province of the Human Services Agency. It wasn't their problem, not my problem. They had to understand that they had a stake in it too and they were going to be held accountable. So, M Melody, the, you, you, this is actually to, to both Gordon and Melody. You all have seen a lot of stuff going on, a lot of, 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 of poverty fighting efforts at the city level, at the county level, at the state level. Is Linda right? Is this some, is what, we, what was created in New York uh, adaptable to municipalities that are not New York? Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> You just, you had that look of like, the out. answer was right there. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll tell you why I think this is crucial. This quality of life issue is huge for every city, and you can't really address those issues if you don't tackle this problem. And I think the fact that CEO under the CIF partnership was able to attract other cities um, to be its partner in this effort um, is, is testament to that um, issue. Secondly, think about it. What are two of the other things that mayors really worry about every day? They don't always have direct control over education, uh, but it's very local, right? And it matters a lot to them and the long-term future of their city. And the second one, which is unfortunately all too familiar to all of us right now, is this whole issue of crime and policing. Um, those issues are you know, intimately tied up with the whole challenge uh, and problems of poverty. There were a couple of issues in a couple of ways in which New York is unique. It, it does have more resources. It does have the New York counties generally do have a little more at stake than other places. Um, but on the other hand, it's a county administered system, which means a lot of the service delivery was at the county and city level. 
That's the same as California. Yeah. That's the same as Ohio. Right. It's the same as many of our biggest um, uh, of our biggest cities are in that kind of county administered structure. So there are some things that make unique, uh, New, New York unique, but I think the the rising nature of the problem and um, um, the reason why we all have to address it, uh, I, I think Linda's right. They more and more cities are recognizing they have to have an agenda here. Melody, adaptable to other places or not? Uh, I believe so, and I, I think every city, every county has to come to the table. You know, where you sit is where you stand. Um, and as Gordon was just saying, different cities and counties have varying levels of authority. You've got strong mayor models, and less or so, you've got control over various arms of the government, you know, the education system, et cetera. But at the same time, if, I think if you mine the data <laughs> that's embedded in the CEO model, that cities and counties can identify the places where they can engage as well. So the idea of the innovation lab, absolutely, um, by engaging across government, um, not just thinking about this as a siloed, marginalized issue, but uh, operating across government, engaging stakeholders and engaging the community, um, talking to those on the ground who have been doing this work, but also talking to other cities um, to identify the best practices being, that have been surfaced in New York and other uh, cities that have benefited from the Social Innovation Fund. It's a way to start to gather these good ideas and think about how they can be deployed in the city. The resources, and we've talked about you know, the sizable resources available to New York City, and many other cities and counties don't have those, but at the same time, there are community foundations. There mm -hmm. are national foundations that are becoming ever more place-based in their thinking. Um, corporate foundations, kind of the list goes on in terms of being creative about how to access resources. One of the things I found interesting in the work that I've done with localities is often, and people have said this, they're like, we were just focused here, and we needed someone to have a, pick our heads up and say, oh, okay. these are resources that are available to us that we never even considered or even practices and ways of going about doing things that are not specifically tied to money um, that we hadn't thought about before. And then certainly with data and evidence. And I think this is one of the challenges as I work with local communities that are trying to, that are in different places, different levels of maturity as they start to access data and put in place evidence-based policies and practices. You know, again, everyone is at a different point, but it, developing a strategy, um, looking at the existing data systems and thinking smartly and working with others who know this field so well to, to develop what you have so that you, your data can, you develop data that can talk to one, data that can talk to one another, um, putting in place the right IT systems and thinking about how you do this so you're creating what can be replicable um, and what people can trust. That can happen, and you know, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a first step, or a hundredth step, or a five hundredth step. So where you are, you can build from there. And it's you know, I want to come in because I, I mean, and I'm sorry to do that, but um, no, but I think I realized <laughs> that I gave you the glasses half full answer, and because that's yeah, that is who I am. <laughs> Hearing these guys um, um, answer as well makes me realize that. I think, my, I think the answer about this is who mayors are and what they want to do, that was their hope and dream mayorship. The reality is that mayor's offices are stunningly cash stra st strapped and staff poor. And so the same person that has to lead the early child development work also has to lead the public-private partnership, also has to lead the data evaluation, also has to lead the digital technology. And before you know it, they have so many things to do that they can't and I think one of the biggest challenges, and this is really what I love about RFA's work, is that we need mechanisms that can um, share knowledge, that can avoid cities having to repeat um, the same exercises over and over and over again, that you know, everybody is reinventing the wheel in the mayor's offices and there are not enough um, um, mechanisms of um, knowledge dissemination and sharing to shortcut that process in order to allow these practices to spread. And so I think, I think that um, it's a great potential that's there, and I think it's a modern necessity to transform leadership in that way. And I think mayors really want to do it, but I don't think they are 
at this point resource sufficiently to do it. I, I, I have to agree. That was sort of the point of my question. Oh, good. I'm glad I'm, I got I'm that. I'm, I'm, from, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm from St. Louis, which mm -hmm. is you know notoriously uh, small, poorly staffed inner city with hostile counties, all you know, mm -hmm. county municipalities in the dozens around it. Um, I would say one thing that's changed, just to be on my soapbox here, is poverty has spread certainly in St. Louis, outside the bounds right. of the city. Right. So you have municipalities like Ferguson mm -hmm. that have less capacity to provide social services than even St. Louis does. And so there's a little bit more of an opening on the part of suburban mayors and county officials and so forth to maybe work together, but mm -hmm. it is a capacity issue. Let me yep. move yep. to what the lesson is for the federal government. So here you've seen something happen to integrate programs and data at you know, this, the level of New York City, which is a big place. What are the lessons can, that can be applied to the federal government? And I mean that in two ways. And I'm, I'll, I'll ask uh, Melody first, because I think you probably handled some of this in your duties at the White House. First, what can the federal government do for municipalities, for counties, for states, to help them do what New York's done? Well, I, I think a whole host of things. I mean, in several administrations, I mean, there have been efforts to move the ball forward with regard to data and evidence collection. Um, but there are a number of other, other things, including the strategy and the architecture that's necessary um, so that the federal government can gather information create, for example, a clearinghouse. That's one of the things that we hope will come out of the newly passed federal legislation that gives localities something to tap into. Again, Let going... Me just say, what is the new federal legislation? So, Most people... Um, the Evidence-Based uh, Evidence, Evidence -based Policy Commission Act um, that was passed in the spring. Um, and there's a commission that um, appointees made by the president um, the minor majority and minority leaders of both the House and the Senate get to make. We are hoping the last of those appointments will be made soon. Um, so that we can study both the collection of data um, and how to ensure that that's relevant, um, that it can be acted upon, a whole host of issues that go along with data collection. Um, but also looking at this idea of putting together a clearinghouse. Um, and it's one of the things, if you read Moneyball for Government, um, first or second edition, um, then you can, you might as well plug the book, um, that you can, when you look at that, you'll see one of the ideas there is that if we start to pull together these good evidence-based policy, policy ideas, there's a repository that people can turn to um, and you're not reinventing the wheel. And this goes to the capacity building issue that we were just talking about. Um, you don't have to invent fire over and over again. Um, so doing, working along those lines, because the federal government does have a lot of data um, at, at its fingertips, making it useful. Um, also, how do we uh, develop less expensive um, evidence and evaluation tools? Um, We've talked about some of those that are considered to be the gold standard and some of them that are quite expensive, but there's also a range as we go you know, up, up the ladder and up different places and different things that can be deployed. And in fact, I believe that you all did that in New York City. Everything wasn't <clears throat> handled, uh, handled at the randomized control trial level. Um, so how do we develop those kinds of tools and put them in place and, uh, and accessible um, to localities so that they can start and build, as I said, you know, where you sit is where you stand. Um, so there are a host of things like that that the federal government can do um, to make what it's capturing more useful to localities. And can I just yes, say absolutely. something? The, the, the detail on that is that, you know, we have these large programs administered at the local level, SNAP, Medicaid, cash welfare, <coughs> earned income tax credit, um, and they gather information about individuals and they provide assistance to them and they don't talk well to each other, and the people that are evaluating their success don't merge the data well. We did more of that in New York City than I think anywhere else. And then we have this survey-based data gathering collection that's in the Census Bureau that tries to evaluate the success based on what people tell them on surveys, when we know over here, by just looking at the admin data, what's really going on in those households. And we need to do more of that, too, so that we can 
make our evaluation of the relative success of these programs much stronger by knowing what's really going on okay, in low income Gordon, families. Okay, Gordon, why can't we do that? What, what Robert just said. <laughs> take, yes. the, take the administrative data and mesh it with the census data. Yeah. It's complicated. <laughs> and the reason it's complicated is because we're trying to balance efficiency against privacy concerns. And there are two really different camps of people in Congress, one of whom really wants to drive an evidence agenda and take advantage of data the way we have it, and another group of people who worry a lot that this is overreach um, and that um, people's privacy uh, will be violated. Um, it's a legitimate issue, but it's one that I think is resolvable if people of goodwill are willing to come together uh, and really talk about it. Um, just to take a painful um, example from our work at MDRC, a lot of the times the federal government will pay us, we win an RFP, to go out and do a study that requires us to go to five different states and get welfare data, for example, or um, local administrative employment and earnings data that's part of the unemployment insurance system. That agency is sitting with the data they're paying me to go to the local government and, get, and the state government and get because they have it for another purpose, enforcement of child support. But the law has very narrowly written um, how that data could be used. And so the same agency that has the data is paying me to go out and collect it again, and they're paying every other contractor who does a study for them. Now, there have been some recent changes that we now are getting a little more access to that data set. So it, um, we've made a little progress, but uh, surely we can do better than that. I want to add two pieces there, which are uh, really important to, to sort of say out loud, but they make you uncomfortable. Um, one is that there are strong forces um, that, are, that um, are not interested in sharing data, and they have, um, for policy reasons and program reasons, they don't want the accountability that the open data and um, the ac accessible data will give. And, um, and they're not always honest about their answers, but they're there and they're very strong, and, um, and that, creates, um, that creates a huge challenge. And then the other thing is that the <coughs> confidentiality laws are interpreted by nervous lawyers who are, bottom line is to keep their boss out of jail and out of court and out of uh, you know, litigation, whatever you're keeping them out of. And the, the easiest answer to succeed in their job is to say no. And a culture of no becomes the protective defense also for people who don't want whether it's families or clients or programs to understand what's going on in the case file. And so we'll say, sorry, confidentiality. And those, those efforts, when they have to get done over and over and over again at the local level, can grind these data sharing efforts to a, a complete halt very quickly. And it's another role that the federal government can play in helping to like, just clear up the record Make it known, like you know, what more guidance in, um, on what's possible and what's not, and um, and sharing that knowledge out so that the localities don't have to repeat themselves. You know, I know that we're going to have some questions from the audience, and I want to I want to open up the floor. Uh, do we have Do we have time for for that? I hope so. Yeah. Um, and 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 there's no one who can say yes or no. But I'm, 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 I'm going <laughs> to so use my Karen said yes. She's Karen's, the boss. Okay, great. So I want to use my. Uh, my moderator's privilege to have the first question go to Matt. Uh, and uh, I guess my question is, how is CEO doing under Mayor de Blasio? Is it, are, are, we, are we still going? still going? Stand up and, and if you can. <laughs> the importance of the work so that, yeah, CEO is, is, is 
persisting. Um, but more than persisting, I think we're thriving. And so I just want to share a few of the ways that I think uh, CEO is evolving in ways that I think would please the panel and, and other champions of evidence-based government. So first, we are uh, continuing unabated the kind of experimental innovation work that uh, CEO is known for. Um, the budget has been unaffected from what we inherited. Uh, the, uh, we have launched numerous new innovations around uh, workforce development and college persistence. There are 39 evaluations that are either launched or underway or completed in the last two years. Uh, we continue to work with uh, partners like MDRC and others on all of that work. Um, importantly, we also are continuing the commitment to and what doesn't work and continue what does. And Gordon referenced uh, the continuing what does. I feel very proud that we as an administration have put significant resources behind the kinds of things that were first established as successful under CEO pilot. So um, CUNY ASAP, um, we're, you know, a pilot of 1,000, 3,000 at the beginning of the administration, and we're expanding to 25,000 students by 2019. So really taking evidence and moving to scale. Similarly, when uh, CEO evaluations have shown the critical importance of sector-based training and job training in workforce outcomes, we've taken uh, evidence from independent evaluations to totally revamp in the city uh, the workforce approach, uh, doubling down on sector-based uh, approaches um, and job training. Uh, and so uh, on that front, I want to underscore some of the ways that we're evolving. I think um, it is a frontier to think about ways that individual pilots and evidence that we learn from that can be coupled with using evidence applied to programs at scale. And so in addition to continuing to innovate, we're doing work to embed uh, the practices and principles of CEO into the way that the city functions generally into our core budget processes. So some, a couple of quick examples on that. One, just uh, in addition to evaluating the individual new initiatives, we're using uh, CEO's evaluation capabilities and applying them to the citywide signature efforts of the administration like uh, the universal pre-K program, community schools and other things. Uh, we're um, taking uh, an approach to look at the existing streams of work that exist across agencies like workforce development and developing common metrics to be able to make relative judgments about which programs are performing better so that we can allocate more dollars to the higher performing models and less dollars to the, to the traditionally underperforming models. Um, so embedding the use of evidence into the way that the core operations are functioning. Um, and lastly, I think we're expanding a, a bit on the capabilities that we have internally, doing more around data analytics so that we can take advantage of more of administrative data, embedding behavioral economics and human-centered design and technology innovation in ways that I think married with CEO's traditional focus on rigor uh, is going to allow us to offer new um, kinds of lessons to, to what it means to govern with excellence. And then finally, I, of course, it's our core administration's uh, mission uh, to address poverty and inequality. And so um, I couldn't, we've established for the first time a concrete measure to move uh, 800,000 people out of poverty or near poverty um, and utilizing something that you didn't mention, which is an amazing pioneering effort of CEO to establish uh, a way of measuring poverty within New York City that goes beyond the traditional federal measure but takes into account the important after tax and transfer payments that have a real material meaning on folks' lives. So uh, very proud to continue to try and maintain and build on the legacy of CEO and grateful uh, for the opportunity to share a little bit about what we're doing now. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, open it to the audience. This, this young lady right here. Um, can you want to uh, move the microphone there? Thank you. Um, I'm Shakti Shah. I'm the Fidelity Federal Fund, but with the British government and the European Commission on Poverty. I'm to do again. But um, um, <laughs> when we, it's actually related to the earlier point about measuring poverty. In both organizations, we really struggle with whether we should use relative or absolute measures of poverty. Because different kinds of programs work better with different But my question is, how did you, did you choose um, what, what impact did that have on your team? 
Well, this is going to be fun because the one thing that Robert and I fought the most about was the poverty measure. So let's see how this answer goes. Um, it may be good for me not to participate in the answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's always better to participate. Yeah, right. The, um, what we, it's interesting because uh, we decided, um, and the moment that this happened when you know, we had this whole earned income tax credit approach where there was like $20 million a year that was going unclaimed and we figured out a way, our finance commissioner figured out a way to use electronic records basically to mail people their checks. All they had to do was sign the form, you know, you know it, was, it, was, it was wonderful. The mayor was so happy. He's like, great, Linda, how much is this going to reduce poverty? And I'm like, well, you know, none, because um, the federal poverty measure doesn't count it, so it won't show up in the numbers. Basically, he threw the paper. He just like, you know, it's, it's all you know what. Um, but it was the start. It was, it, in some ways, it was a great lesson, because like in that moment, he got the problem with the fo poverty measure right like that. And it um, um, made him eager to hear ideas about how to change it. And so, you know, so we scanned the world, um, and we actually spent some time in the UK, because this is the moment when Tony Blair um, was doing his whole poverty initiative. So we went over there to see what they were doing, and we sat down with the folks who were doing the new poverty measure there, which is a very, rel at that point, their study was a very relative measure. Like, um, you know, do, you know uh, we, we got lots of giggles over it, because they, you measure funny things in the UK. Um, but, um, but it was, you know, it was a very different approach. We looked at, you know, emerging happiness indicators. And, and so we, we searched the world and we wound up in our own backyard. And in fact, we did most of the work a couple of blocks away by um, bringing together the experts that are in the National Academy of Sciences recommendations to revise the poverty measure, um, to not to um, alter it completely, not a new approach, but just update it. Um, you know, food is no longer one third of a household's cost, it's one eighth. And so you need to recognize the change reality of the cost that people bear now who are, you know, need to, you know, meet their daily needs like transportation and, you know, childcare and things like that. So reflecting more um, robustly on the expenditure side, the true cost of living, so raising that, um, that threshold up, but then being honest on the revenue side that the um, what's in people's pockets is greater than what the, the poverty measure now counts, like post-tax refunds, like income transfers that are tied to housing and nutrition. You know, food uh, SNAP and housing assistance, like 25, 28% of the households in New York, poor households in New York City, have subsidized um, rent. So it's a huge income to them, but it's not counted, not counted in, in household resources. So what we decided to do was rather than you know, take a whole different approach. We decided to implement essentially the National Academy um, um, definition. Um, it was a ton of work, and again, we um, we wanted that answer for New York City. But you know, already we were having you know we're gonna you know we're gonna do this, and then maybe it'll nudge the the federal government along. And in fact, one of our um, um, one of our advisors on this process um, was um, Becky Blank who, you know, five minutes later, after we got it done, went over to Commerce to head, am I getting my agencies right? Yes, mm -hmm. the, right? that's good. And, and she championed the supplemental federal measure that is now done nationally that, you know, it's in, you know, and I don't want to take credit for that, but, um, but she said, Linda, I'm going to go do it. And I'm like, go, oh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so now with all that, why did Robert and I fight about it? Well, why um, don't I say? <laughs> all right, you say. <laughs> So the, um, one of the things about the National Academy measure and the new supplemental measure is that it does have a relativity component in it, and the New York City measure does as well. So that as the, the median income or the consumption rate for the whole population rises, the, um, the threshold rises. And as you know, the threshold and the resources are how you calculate poverty. So for people in the anti-poverty program world who are trying to ensure that SNAP benefits get into households to make them less likely to be poor or earn income tax credit. That relativity component can sometimes feel like we're moving the goalposts a little bit. As every year goes on, if the economy as a whole gets better, well, the number got moved up a little bit. Um, so one of the things that I found most interesting in the national debate is Christopher Wimmer's work where he anchors the supplemental rate in the starting date and then moves it up only by an inflationary adjustment. 
And I would have been happier if that was done, so that it didn't have a relativity component. It was about alleviating poverty and then increasing the threshold based on a cost of living increase. So that's the one aspect about the shifting to a new measure that is related to your direct question, was it relativity or absolute? Uh, we all agree that the resources should be counted. We all agree the threshold should be changed and the metric for determining the starting point. The question was whether we needed to tie the threshold to a change in the consumption patterns of the population as a whole or to an annual inflationary adjustment. Okay, I get to respond and then you get to respond. Yeah. But I'm really, this is be really fast. Great example to me is cell phones. And I remember actually having this conversation early on. You know, cell phones, it's a, it's a convenience, right? It's a, um, a smartphone, it's, you know, come on, you know, if, you, if things are so bad, how is it that everyone in your household is able to afford um, a smartphone? Um, that shouldn't be included. That's the kind of sort of rel relative expense that's added to the, you know, calculation about what, what you need to get by. I find no problem whatsoever in including that because we know how information technology and smartphones are inherent to full participation in society. And so, so for me, it's a, it, it is what is necessary, and it's not as if it's you know, a life of abundance, but what is necessary to ensure the minimum level of, of full participation in society. One more? No, I think that's, I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm with you on that. Okay. okay, I agree with you on that. And that was victory yeah, there right there. there. <laughs> I won one. <laughs> um, this lady right here in the front row. Right here. Yes. Hello, uh, good afternoon. My name is Jenny Davis. I am an intern at Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, and I'm also a grad student at Duke University. Um, I want to thank the panel for your discussion, your points of view, and I think this is a very interesting topic. Um, I'm actually researching on uh, um, urbanization, but more specifically uh, urbanizational urban agriculture and what cities' um, roles are in terms of leading the way of urban ag agriculture and how to feed people. Um, as you all know, you all are very brilliant people, but um, there is going to be a, a huge a shortage of food um, if we do not act now. And also there's gonna be growing inequalities surrounding food and especially in cities. And so my question is, um, with your initiative in New York City, have you all addressed the, the, the role of food and how it can alleviate poverty? Um, so, one of the things we haven't discussed is the other aspects of poverty uh, fighting that Mayor Bloomberg believed in and continued that were part of the city's uh, uh, approach or enhanced during the course of his administration outside of the CEO. And one of those was, was that he believed strongly in a work-focused welfare policy, but also in rewarding work for people that enter the labor market at low, at low parts of the wage scale. And that meant that he strongly, he took a real turn from the previous administration that was sort of all, all welfare benefits are bad, and that would include food stamps. So during the Bloomberg administration, there was a very significant increase in the provision of food assistance through the SNAP program in New York City as, in part, a work support to reward low-wage work. I think, I think if we look at it, the increase is greater than in any city, and it was certainly greater than at any other time in the history of the city. Uh, quite remarkable. Um, so the mayor firmly believed in providing food assistance to New Yorkers uh, through that program and enhanced it. And he did some other things as well. And, I, and to Robert um, did great work at the agency in not just getting more food stamps into people's pockets, but using the, and we're old generation, so we still say food stamps, using the food stamp program to leverage nutritional benefits and to drive yeah. Food, good, healthy, nutritious food supply. And so um, using, uh, giving everybody electronic benefit transfer um, stations at farmer's markets. So really, and then doubling if you buy healthy fruits and vegetables, the value of your food stamps doubles. And so thinking about ways of both driving supply and demand to, um, to leverage the, those dollars for improved nutritional benefits. One of my great frustrations that, um, that we were never successful at getting was the approval of the federal government to, um, to ban the use of food stamps to purchase um, um, sugar-sweetened beverages. And so that, to me, was a, a big disappointment. So, um, but there was, um, um, 
a lot of creative efforts around obesity and then thinking about how the, the income, the, the dollars for food could also be leveraged for better nutrition. Right. Gordon, I, I, I just would add, living in Brooklyn and New York, that there was a major push at the same time to expand green markets and to yeah. make sure they got into low-income neighborhoods. And that was where the doubling of the value of your food stamps if you purchased in one of those green markets came in. And I, I was also going to add, as my guess is that you are doing, keeping an eye on these issues. It always feels like we're in a farm bill cycle. <laughs> um, but with the, yeah, you've experienced that. Um, but as we head into the next farm bill negotiation, the Double Up Food Bucks program, the EBT transfer, all of that um, is always um, threatened. Um, so keeping an eye on those kinds of programs because of their potential to leverage good access to good nutritious food into low-income homes. I also think that we need to look at urban agriculture um, as not only a way to get nutritious food into homes, but it's also a workforce development and job creator. Um, and we're, as we see increasing uses of um, closed uh, loop farming um, and technology in that way, that they, it increases opportunity for job training and access to a growing number of jobs. Farming, it isn't your grandfather's farm anymore. Um, and that's also another way to think about um, increasing opportunity for low-income communities. I, I also should say that I was the co-chair of the National Hunger Commission that issued a report last year on these issues. And in it, we got in some of the discussion of sharing of data, greater coordination of programs, greater focus on employment, and other issues concerning food policy uh, that are, are worth looking into. Uh, Gentleman in the, f in, the, in the back there. Thank you. Uh, this oversimplifies what you're doing. We're all here because we applaud what you're doing. Uh, but I'm going to say it again. Venture capital, again, oversimplifying what you're doing. Uh, like 100 uh, proposals that we've got here. That's the easy part. The hard part is this. Third round, uh, there's a lot of judgment that goes into a very simple construction product. Uh, yet, what, uh, maybe five to seven venture capital deals are walking dead. So if somebody's making judgments along the way with a very simple metric, and clearly you have made the right judgments along the way. My question isn't isn't uh, that you haven't done a good job. My question is, is it scalable? Because a lot of this isn't in the numbers. It has to do with judgment. Could you comment on that and what you learn? Great question. It's, um, I'm not sure if I understand that it's, a, because to me, the, the transformation that evidence-based policy making offers is, um, um, it's, it's actually, there's two elements to it. One is that it's, um, is that you want to know that you're investing dollars where um, there's evidence that it works. And of course, um, replication has to accommodate local circumstances. But um, increasingly, we're trying to move dollars away from um, sort of promises and prayers and more into proven performance. That was really good alliteration. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, sorry. Um, so <laughs> but it was good, right? It um, and so, so I think it's, we're, doing ex we're trying to do exactly what you suggested, but it's not to the exception of experimentation and innovation. And I think an environment that has this framework of evaluation and metrics allows for experimentation. And in I think you have to encourage failure. I think that if people don't, take enough risks, we're never going to learn. And so, so I see it as an umbrella of accountability across programs that, and under that umbrella are, um, are, are opening of more opportunities for accountability, understanding that failure is part of the process. So I'm not, I'm not sure if I understood your question, but that to me is, um, you know, is, is the vision of kind of the overall environment that we want people to work within. I just, can, I'll go ahead. You can. I was just going to add a couple of things. One, that's also one of the reasons that 
we have touched on in several different ways the Social Innovation Fund. And I'm not saying that is the only answer. And the Social Innovation Fund is now five, six years old. Um, so there's continual refinement. But the fact that CEO got SIF dollars, that those SIF dollars went to putting the best of these programs into other states is part of the effort, one of the efforts to scale them. Um, also, when I think about a program, um, Gordon was talking about CUNY ASAP, that's another example of the kind of program that can be implemented in a system, through a systems change lens. So, and that's where you start to talk about scale. When you start to talk about, okay, what can we do in community college systems around the, co around the country, then all of a sudden you take something that's working in a community college system that hopefully will be scaled to 25,000 people, but what, almost a quarter million people in that system. But then you can start to put into other systems around the country. So I think constantly we have to think about what's working, gathering that information, and what tools and avenues do we have to try and scale them. And I think looking in systems, K through 12, community college, there are other kinds of systems that's the way that we start to move to scale in the way that we so desperately need. So we don't have a lot of time left, and what I would like to do is kind of a lightning round. So if people have questions, raise your hands, ask your question really quickly. I'm going to take three questions, and then all of you just answer what you can, in, as we can, in just, in, in just a few minutes. So who's got the microphone? Um, uh, the lady right behind you has had her hand up. Very quickly, ma'am. Yes, thank you. Thanks for the panelist. My question is really go to the basic. First, you want to solve the poverty problem. So first is the root cause of the poverty. Have you analyzed those? And how do you sure the beneficiary are identified and they really get a benefit? And I'm concerned about public-private partnership. They usually transfer, divert the resource to benefit somebody else rather than the targeted beneficiaries. OK, great. Uh, uh, the gentleman right here. What are the panelists' opinion about block grants as far as improving innovation? OK, great. Um, That's a good one. Uh, right here. I'd love to hear more about um, other uh, places in the country where you've seen this um, breaking down of silos and working cross-sector take root. Okay, great. I'm going to take one more. I saw this, this uh, young lady right here. Quite often the governors are the engines of change. How do we get this message to the governors who are cutting back on education and a lot of the programs you've addressed? Great. So we've got root causes. Do you know the root causes? Do you know the beneficiaries are getting the focus? Um, we've got block grants, block block grants. Mm -hmm. um, places, other places. Yeah, you know, other places, places and, and can we get the governors uh, involved? So this is open to all of you. Pick, pick just one of them. You don't have to. Everybody doesn't have to answer all, all four. Gordon, you're you're stroking your cheek. <laughs> so <laughs> you got the answer right there. Well, I'm trying to think of one answer for all the four yeah, questions yeah. Uh, together. <laughs> um, look, I mean, and it ties to the question that we had before. Um, there the example was, this is, um, you know, they have a for-profit um, benchmark. In these cases, we had a randomized controlled benchmark. That's a pretty high hurdle uh, to cross. And one of the big changes that's occurred in the evolution that Matt was describing for CEO um, is that they've really turned to scaling, and they're focused on scaling those things that have really good evidence. So I think we are beginning to make some of the, uh, to take on some of the kind of challenges um, that, that you were describing. The block grant uh, issue is a really complicated one. There's a lot of argument that says, look, these problems are all local. Melody and I and, and everyone has been making that point. On the other hand, those, um, unless they're well structured, there's a lot of room for states to use those resources to displace other resources and nothing really gets, n no net value gets added. And then last, underlying all these questions, is this question of the role of evidence. How do we get evidence um, to really be a driver of policy at the local level? Um, I, th I think the message about innovation is starting to get there. Um, one of the ways that Congress has begun to do this more systematically, thanks to RFA, 
um, is that they, for example, in the maternal, infant, and early childhood development um, home visiting program, uh, part of it was they identified as part of the law what are the four or five programs that have strong enough evidence. They then said to states, those are the only programs that you can use your dollars for in your state when you're administering this program. If you see a gap, there's extra money over here where you can experiment with innovation. Um, and I think then the, the challenge is we're building the evidence. Now we really need to create mechanisms, legislative mechanisms and other mechanisms that get state and local governments to actually use the federal dollars they're getting to fund those programs with the best evidence. We hear this all the time. You're harping on the evidence. OMB's demanding the evidence. At the local level, my local programs, if you talk to a national nonprofit, that's a kind of a mixed message about evidence. So I think that's the next frontier in really delivering. I'll take the cross-sector question. Um, another piece of work that Michelle and I, Michelle and I have been working together for like 400 years or something, <laughs> but Michelle and I worked on together, starting at the White House that's now outside of government, is thinking about cross-sector work um, and embedding uh, data and evaluation into that work. Um, we started with a council at the White House that was looking at that issue generally, but has gone on and evolved to focus, or in, included in that, focusing on building education to employment pathways for opportunity youth, 16 to 24 year olds, out of work, out of the, out of the labor force. Um, this work continues now at the Aspen Institute. Um, the federal government, uh, one of the things that the federal government continues to do, coming, building off of that, um, is what we call P3, or performance partnership pilots. Um, that bring together the work across departments and agencies, much in the way that you all were doing on the local level, um, to bring together resources and funds and an approach to dealing with what most people call disconnected youth. Again, we call opportunity youth and building out um, these kinds of pathways for them um, and looking for the best of what is happening in those kinds of, of pilot programs. At the same time, outside of the government, um, we are, at Aspen, are working with about 23 communities, urban, rural, and tribal, again, doing cross-sector work. A data and uh, evaluation is a part of the work in every community. Again, every community is at a different place in terms of its maturity level with the use of data, but it is critical um, and being used in every place um, to try and understand how these pathways are be being built um, how uh, collective impact, the strategy for change is being deployed, and looking at the outcomes that we have set for those communities in terms of um, completion of post-secondary and going on to um, a family wage sustaining job um, for young people. So that's an example in government, outside of government, cross-sector, and the use of, of data and evidence. So um, I think the governors are very much a part of this and could be, and I think if they were sold on the Bloomberg model, ambitious and creative governors could really do more than they currently are, so I completely agree they're a player. Uh, when it comes to uh, block grants, I definitely, as one who's run some of these programs, am aware of the different rules and requirements in the different silos and the extent to which there's a lot of frustration at the local level that, that the, the keeping those monies in these separate silos prevents them from serving the whole client in a comprehensive way. So I support experiment, rigorously evaluated, carefully done uh, opportunities for states to, to do that, if that's possible. Um, I, I am struck when I work, as long as I've worked in this business, I started as the director of the Child Support Enforcement Program, so I, that's where I come from. The extent to which some of our issues, many of our issues concerning poor families uh, are related to uh, families that are uh, children are born into households without two committed parents there for the long haul. So I definitely believe that's something we should talk about. I would point out it was something that Mayor Bloomberg was not afraid to talk about uh, in New York City. Um, so that would be, uh, those are the three questions I wanted to answer. And so, and then um, I would <coughs> add that I think that there are places where this kind of work is popping up. Like, I, yeah. you know, um, Louisville, New Orleans, Boston, Chicago, um, Austin. There are, there are cities that um, are starting to embed this as a matter of practice and create teams in the mayor's offices to do this. And a lot of that is being facilitated like the fellowship program that Results for America has established. 
um, to try to share these lessons in the sort of the lead policy evaluation officer for, um, for mayors to give them the training and the skills and things like Bloomberg Philanthropies, What Works Cities Initiative, where it's trying to kind of really get underneath what are the key tools that um, can um, that can be adopted at low cost in every jurisdiction and refining them and sharing them. And so there's a number of investments. And, um, and the Obama administration has been pretty spectacular on really pushing the envelope and trying to create these opportunities both to kind of impose them on programs um, as well as to open the doors to invite in uh, more evidence-based policy making and innovation. Um, and so it's created opportunities through, through those pathways as well. So nice reinforcement. But I do think we're at the, um, we're at the, we're at the start of this, this history. And, um, and there aren't, there aren't um, um, you know, I, the fact that I can name the cities yeah, maybe there's, a, I'm sure there's a lot more out there that are doing them, but the fact that I can name them and everyone can say, yeah, that's, those are them. Yep, that's them. You know, that's not good, right? We need so many that we couldn't, you know, fill the room with them. Linda, you have a last word. Thank you, uh, AEI. Thank you, uh, Results for America. Thank you, SICE, for this room. Uh, you all were great. Thank you, and a round of applause for our panel. Thank you, Washington. Thank you, Paul.